Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Gary Taubes. He's the author of Why We Get Fat and Good Calories, Bad Calories. He's a former staff writer for Discover and a correspondent for the journal Science. His writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, and The Esquire, and he's been included in numerous best of anthologies, including the best of the best American science writing. He has received three Science and Society Journalism Awards from the National Association of Science Writers. He's the recipient of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Investigator Award in Health Policy Research and a co founder of Nutrition Science Initiative. And he lives in Oakland, California. That's quite a resume, and it's eminently appropriate for the book we're going to talk about today. The book is called The Case Against Sugar, and uh, it fits with my belief system very nicely, Uh, although the science uh, disputes back and forth about these things. uh, Sugar is uh, is a problem and it it has resulted in uh, some ill health for many people. Is that a fair statement? uh, Yeah, that's certainly a fair statement. The the argument I'm making in this book, the reason I wrote this book, uh, is uh, because for the past century or a little more, we, the worst that uh, the public health community would ever really say about sugar is that it's empty calories. You know, it adds calories to our diet. We get fat because we eat too much, and these doesn't come with any vitamins or minerals or fiber attached. So it's a food we could do without, but there's nothing else wrong with it. And as a journalist, an investigative journalist getting into this story, I had to become a de facto historian as well. And when you look at the history and you look at this problem worldwide, it turns out it's, it's, it's some, some very naive to look at sugar as simply empty calories and that this is a compound that's been linked with diabetes epidemics around the world going back to the 19th century in the United States when the diabetes epidemic that we're living with today first started, you know, first appears in the medical records in hospitals. And it's got unique biochemical, physiological properties that other compounds simply don't have. And so the argument I'm making is that this is, in effect, you you take any human baseline human diet and you add sugar to it, you eventually get obesity and diabetes epidemics. And because obesity and diabetes are both associated with an increased risk of every other major chronic disease, heart disease, uh, stroke, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, you can make an argument, and I do, that sugar is the primary evil Mm -hmm. in modern diet. Yeah, and, and I want to go through some of that in, in, in much more detail, especially the uh, uh, vilify, vilification of fat. But uh, you, you talked about the history of, of diabetes at the end of the 19th century, but you went back to the 6th century B.C. to find a, a Hindu physician who uh, described uh, the sweet urine. Uh, and well, that's a, yeah, and this happened to be shortly after uh, sugar slowly meandered into India. Um, this is an you know, diabetes. I, the book focuses on diabetes because it's an easier case to make than obesity. Um, the uh, diabetes is a disease that physicians have recognized, as you noted, for two thousand years and discussed. Um, you know, often on the literature, it was a relatively easy diagnosis, particularly what we now call type one diabetes, which is the acute form that usually. Uh, the hits in childhood. Um, it's not until the late 18th century, after uh, England uh, basically opens up the sugar trade from Caribbean islands, does diabetes start being mentioned uh, in great detail. And indeed, do physicians notice the sweet smell of the diabetic urine, despite having a long history? Physicians back then, one of their ways of diagnosing was to actually smell urine or ideally have your assistant do it. <laughs> um, the, uh, it doesn't show up, like I said, in the medical records. And one of the, the, the major hospitals like Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and uh, Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia, which uh, both 
are among the oldest uh, public hospitals in the United States, and they actually have their their medical records available back to their opening days, an archivist who you can contact and ask to uh, search their medical records for them, uh, for you. And you can see in this history, uh, particularly in Mass General in Boston, that in the 19th century, the first half of the 19th century, uh, there were years in which uh, Massachusetts General Hospital would not see a single case of diabetes. And then it starts to pick up in the second half of the century. And then post-Civil War, uh, coincident with uh, the creation of the candy industry, the chocolate industry, the ice cream industry, and maybe um, not coincidentally the soft drink industry, mm-hmm. you see more and more cases appearing. And by the 1920s, physicians, particularly Elliot Jocelyn, who was the, considered the god of diabetes in America, Jocelyn was using the term epidemic to, see, to describe what he was seeing, both in his clinic and even in his hometown. Mm-hmm. And uh, physicians back then, researchers, public health researchers, were linking it to sugar consumption. And some very well-meaning, uh, not very well-informed physicians who were kind of playing at being scientists managed to convince the community that sugar wasn't the cause. And by the time a new generation of researchers came along to argue that it clearly should be the prime suspect in the 1960s, uh, we got uh, you know, our, our nutrition research community and the heart disease community were obsessed with this idea that dietary fat was a problem with modern diets. And then the story takes up. That's a story I've been telling in my previous books as well. Mm-hmm. You mentioned your previous books, and we have had uh, nutrition and health uh, authors on this show many times. And uh, you mentioned that all the evidence implies the highly processed and easily digestible carbohydrates, the grains and starchy vegetables, um, and the sugar and high fructose corn syrup are, are part of how we got in this mess. And uh, I know that uh, the, the fast food industry in particular uses the term super palatable for uh, some of the, the foods that they serve. And it, it all adds up because it all winds up as glucose in the system, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't, and that's one of the misconceptions. Actually, that was one of the misconceptions that Elliot Jocelyn had back in 1924 when he started arguing that sugar wasn't the cause of diabetes. Um, Starches, uh, potatoes, grains, break down in our body to eventually to glucose, and it ends up in glucose in our bloodstream, and it raises our blood sugar. Blood sugar is blood glucose. So when your doctor might give you something called a glucose tolerance test, he's testing your ability to keep your blood sugar under control. When we're talking about sugar, the sweet stuff, sucrose, which is the sugar you get from uh, sugar cane or sugar beets and white powdered stuff you put on your cereal in the morning or in your coffee, um, or high fructose corn syrup, these are roughly 50-50 mixtures of glucose and fructose. And fructose is the sweetest of the sugars. That's why it's, we taste sugars as sweet. And fructose is often known as fruit sugar because you find it in fruit, and it's what makes fruit sweet. And then you find sucrose in fruit as well. So the issue here is the fructose is metabolized almost primarily by your liver. And we... Our livers are designed, in effect, to deal with the kind of fructose load they would get in fruit seasonally. So maybe a couple months a year, uh, our primitive ancestors would consume fruit, and they would have to digest that fruit and break the, the, the sugar and fructose molecules off the fiber, and it would take time to do it. And they wouldn't eat that much of it, or maybe they would eat a lot for a month and get a little fatter over the course of a month, but then the fruit would go out of season and they wouldn't see sugar for the rest of the Mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, we have a sugar industry, and we have candy and, you know, uh, uh, sugar-loaded treats and sugary beverages, and now we're getting the equivalent of, you know, a day's worth of sugar per meal. Mm Mm-hmm. And we're drinking it all day long, and our livers have to do a job that they were never designed to do. And like 
any device that asked to do a job wasn't designed to do. They do it poorly. And I don't want to leave fructose without mentioning it. For a while, people were claiming that that was going to be the answer for diabetics. That they were going to well, use that fructose. was one of the yeah one of the misconceptions that helped uh, sort of divert the medical nutrition research community from getting what I think is the right answer. Mm -hmm. But. In the late 1970s, they started focusing on something called the glycine. There was focus uh, drawn to something called the glycemic index, which is how quickly uh, we digest the glucose in starches and other foods and how quickly that glucose gets into our bloodstream. And then we secrete insulin in response to the glucose. And a diabetic who's got insulin, either uh, the insulin resistance and the common form of diabetes that's called type 2, or insufficient insulin secretion in type 1, um, they have trouble dealing with the glucose specifically. So the idea was fructose, because it's metabolized in the liver, doesn't require insulin to metabolize it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a good thing, and we should consume high fructose products, or we could consume sugar because it's half fructose, and that'll lower the, lessen the load on the pancreas, lessen the need for insulin, and this makes sugar basically a good thing for diabetics. But again, this was a very simplistic way of looking at this because what the fructose was doing in the liver may have been actually causing the diabetes to begin with. Mm -hmm. And eventually some of these researchers started figuring this out and the American Diabetes Association backed off from its recommendation that sugars and fructose should be consumed freely by diabetics. But in the meanwhile, I, you know, the, again, the story that's being told here is our nutrition research community focused on fat uh -huh. and salt. Fat and salt were the bad things in our diets, and they did studies looking at trying to demonstrate that fat and salt were bad for us. The actual studies couldn't do it, not that you would know it from the rhetoric right. we get from these people. And by the 1980s, we were pushing the whole country onto a low-fat, low-salt diet. And when you take fat and salt out of the diet, the only thing left that really, you know, it conspicuously provides pleasure, other than the subtlety of spices, is sugar. Mm -hmm. So we got this, the message was a healthy diet is low in fat and low in salt, and the food industry said, fine, we'll do that, but we're going to put sugar back in or high fructose corn syrup and other form of sugar so that people buy our products because otherwise they're going to be insipid, tasteless things. And the message the rest of us got was we can eat sugar. Sugar isn't a problem. Our high fructose corn syrup isn't a problem. It doesn't have fat in it. It's healthy. It's from fruit. Mm -hmm. What could possibly go wrong? And... The answer is it looks like just about everything. Yeah, indeed. And I, I, I can remember, you know, buying low-fat salad dressing and seeing the sugar content on the back and being concerned about that at the time. Um, but I don't think a lot of people did. But one of the things that I've, I've seen many times uh, claimed, and I don't know how valid it is, but you, you talk about whether sugar is a drug or a food, is that sugar is more addicting than cocaine, according to some people. Well, it is to animals. I should put it this it is to rats and, and mice. You can do these studies in rats and mice, and they were done by a group in France where you addict them to a, a cocaine or heroin, and then you give them the opportunity to either stick with the coke and the heroin or switch to sugar. And the, these rodents will get off, they'll make the cocaine switch immediately. It takes them a few days to, to decide that they prefer sugar to heroin. Um, so that we can say for sure. In humans, like, you can't do these studies, and you certainly can't do them with kids. Um, so the, my favorite saying on this, and I quote this in the book, is from a, a journalist historian, whom I'm proud to say is a friend of mine because he's so talented, uh, Charles Mann, who in his book, 1493, when he discussed the spread of sugar around the world post-Columbus, said uh, scientists today debate amongst themselves whether or not sugar is an addictive substance or people just act like it is. Mm -hmm. And that's one of these issues. Sometimes we ask too much from science, and if you're a parent particularly, you do not need scientists to tell you whether or not sugar has a hold over your children's brains right. <laughs> that other substances simply don't have. Um, 
And uh, my book was informed. If I was not a parent of, of two young boys, I would have had a different, you know, that, that just sort of set the context for my writing this book as well, because I, I simply think life would have been easier if we weren't constantly fighting about sugar. Mm-hmm. And while we're on the topic of, of sugar and, and drugs, we ought to mention the tobacco industry and what cigarettes did when they made blended tobaccos and added a little sugar in to make them, uh, um, well, tastier, but also uh, acidic. Which, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, acidic so that it's easier to hold the smoke in your lungs. Yeah, and I, it's, this is one of the was one of the revelations to me, and it's interesting because it really it didn't fit into the general uh, argument of this book, but it was such an amazing story that I felt I had to tell it. Um, the great uh, revolution in the tobacco industry in the second half of the 19th century was something called flue-curing tobacco. And when you flue-cure tobacco, you dry the tobacco, and you do it in such a way that you increase the sugar content of the leaves, literally the sucrose content, by about a factor of 10. So it's similar to what happens when a banana ripens. So it goes from being this sort of starchy, almost inedible fruit to, by the time it's ripe or overripe, incredibly sweet. Um, And this is what happened to the tobacco leaves. So um, by the early 1913, R.J.R. Reynolds, the tobacco company, was looking for a new way, basically. They, they, They had been producing something called plug tobacco, chewing tobacco, which is literally marinated in something called a sugar sauce. So you take the leaves and you marinate them in sugar and maple syrup and honey and spices, and you end up with something that tastes good to chew. And they had this sugary tobacco, and they mixed it with the flu-cured blended tobacco, and that happened to maximize, as you put it, makes the, the leaves more acidic, but that allows them to be inhaled without sparking this sort of coughing reflex. It's one of the reasons why tobacco pipe tobacco and pipes and uh, cigars are much harder to inhale than cigarettes. It's the primary reason. So now you could draw the smoke into your lungs, and by doing so you can get the nicotine into your lungs where it's much more addictive. It's got much, much more powerful, so it's got a much more addictive quality. And you can draw the carcinogens deep into your lungs with it. And so you end up with this product that tastes good, it's smooth to smoke, it's incredibly addictive, and it happens to be incredibly carcinogenic as well. And you can see, so cigarettes, the American cigarette just explodes in popularity, first in the U.S. and around the world. By 1930, everyone's making these blended, American blended cigarettes. And um, the tobacco, the lung cancer epidemic, suddenly lung cancer starts showing up in mortality records, which it didn't prior to 1913. Mm-hmm. And so in that sense, what's interesting, I learned about this, as did tobacco industry researchers, in part from a document written by the Sugar Association, the lobbying research arm of the sugar industry in the 1950s, because they were worried that people thought sugar was fattening and they'd stop wanting to drink or eat sugar and they wanted it to diversify. So the industry comes out with this document saying, hey, but look at this great marriage of sugar and tobacco. So even if we can't get people to eat and drink sugar, we're going to sell more and more of it to the wonderfully successful cigarette industry. Mm-hmm. And then they stopped make, you know, making the link publicly and after the 1964 Surgeon General's report linking you know, smoking to cancer. But um, to cigarettes today, still, it's, you know, that's, that's if you're smoking a, a, and virtually any American cigarette, you're getting a significant amount of sugar is what's making it... Uh, enabling the addictive nature of the cigarette. Mm-hmm. Very good. There's th- This is a fascinating history, and you mentioned uh, uh, some of the research, and uh, the Sugar Research Foundation and other uh, later versions of that funded an awful lot of the research to make sure that we believe that sugar was innocuous and that the evils were fat and salt and, and so on. Uh, how did, and, that, and that seemed to influence uh, the sugar delivery systems, which included not only the sweet uh, sodas and ice cream and candy, but also orange juice and cereal. Yeah, well, that's what um, 
again, one of the interesting aspects of this history is, uh, particularly the, the cereal industry. So the cereal industry is founded by health nuts in Minnesota, Kellogg and Post, and they ran sanatoriums for the, the wealthy dyspeptics. And the cereal was a way to get them to eat fiber, and fiber would help them with constipation, and this would supposedly cure all their problems. And they were anti-sugar. Mm-hmm. They thought it was bad for you. So the cereal industry was one of the industries that actually did not just immediately start sweetening their products. And they fought it off for basically half a century, the nutritionists. And then Post, in the late 40s, comes out with uh, Cocoa Puffs, the first uh, sugar-coated cereal. And the other, then you see this sort of arms war in the industry, all the other, the, the nutritionists in the industry are saying, we can't do it, we can't do it, it's bad for you. And the marketers are saying, if we don't do it, we're going out of business. And so one major cereal producer after another folds. And by the 1960s, you know, the American breakfast has been transformed into basically dessert, particularly for kids who are the most susceptible to this, right? And they're targeted. You have entire more the, the morning TV shows that I grew up on in the 60s. Many of them were created to sell cereal, sugar-sweetened cereal. But... Um, the sugar industry, basically what they did, they formed first the Sugar Research Foundation and the Sugar Association, which is still with us today. People like to say they're as bad as the tobacco industry. I don't think they were. I'm actually kind of de- perversely attacking them and defending them simultaneously. Mm-hmm. The nutrition obesity research community was saying dietary fat's the problem, and we get fat because we eat too many calories of all types. And this mantra, calories are calories are calories, it doesn't matter where it comes from. They're incredibly naive science, but this was what we were taught, and this is what we're still taught today. Um, and so the sugar industry, their job is people, nutritionists started appearing saying, well, wait a minute, sugar does some really some things that no other substance does, and we could tie it to heart disease and tie it to diabetes and tie it to obesity. So the sugar industry, what they did is they paid researchers who were convinced fat caused heart disease, particularly at the Harvard School of Public Health, which, uh, I don't know, should have some public mea culpa about their role in all this, Mm -hmm. Um, paid these people basically to write articles saying what they believed was true, and what they believed was true is dietary fat is the problem, not sugar. And there were the researchers who believed it was sugar were ridiculed, and they used these uh, very influential anti-fat people, went after the anti-sugar people, and the anti-fat people won. It was that simple. The science never ended up supporting this fat hypothesis, and it does support the sugar hypothesis, but often science goes through these periods where the, the winners are the ones with the most funding and the strongest personalities, not the ones with the best science. Mm-hmm. And that's what we've seen. So my books are as much, you know, I'm, I'm going, I'm making the case against sugar, but I'm also making the case against some very damaging nutrition uh, and obesity research that's been done over the past century as well. Very good. It's complicated and it's important that that people understand that uh, diabetes doesn't show up right away. It's a generational thing. It may even be, propensity may even be inherited, but there's a process that the body goes through that starts, I guess, with the metabolic syndrome and then the insulin resistance and so on. Talk about that process a little bit that gets us to what we currently label diabetes and obesity. Well, so this is what, uh, again, one of the revelations in my research. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons this science is so hard to do is because we're looking at chronic diseases that take pretty much decades to manifest themselves. So our, our government's pretty good at saying, at, at, at assessing whether or not, and the, the, the system in place, pretty good at assessing whether or not a, a nutrient is a toxin, and, and you, know, you take it, are you going to die or get some awful disease or you inhale it or it's in the groundwater, are you going to manifest disease symptoms in the next weeks or months or maybe uh, six months? It's much, it's very hard to do studies where it takes 20 or 30 or 40 years for the symptoms to appear. So in diabetes, as as you said, the the common form, type 2, which is associated with obesity and overweight and age, uh, 
it starts off as a problem called insulin resistance, and that's so you secrete insulin in response to the glucose primarily in your diet, and the insulin helps you control your blood sugar. It also tells your fat tissue to store fat. Um, and as you become resistant to insulin, you have to secrete more and more insulin, so you have elevated levels of insulin in your blood simultaneously with elevated levels of blood glucose, blood sugar, and it starts this whole cascade of sort of physiological dysregulation that ends up with type 2 diabetes. So eventually you'll be diagnosed as having type 2 diabetes dependent on, often it's done nowadays with a test called a hemoglobin A1C test. Um, the association with obesity made the research community think it was caused by obesity. It's still uh, the conventional wisdom. It's just a problem that's caused by obesity, and obesity is caused by consuming too many calories. And one of my contributions to this field is to, to bring back sort of the, the, the history, look into the history of obesity and find out that there were the best researchers in the field thought it was a hormonal problem, not an overeating problem, and that the hormone that's directly involved in telling us to store fat is insulin, the same hormone that's elevated in type 2 diabetes. So it's quite likely both obesity and type 2 diabetes are caused by the same mm -hmm. dietary phenomena. Or, as you pointed out, and I talk about in my book, passed on from generation to generation. So there's considerable evidence. So if a mother is overweight or obese or pre-diabetic or diabetic when she's pregnant, if she gets what's called gestational diabetes when she's pregnant, she is going to increase the risk of her child being obese or diabetic by a huge amount. And these studies were first done in a Native American population called the Pima in Arizona, who have among the highest rates of diabetes in the world. And each generation has a higher and higher rate of diabetes, and they get type 2 diabetes at younger and younger ages. And what we see in the Pima is happening in the country at large as well, but not in such an extreme way. So what's likely is, you know, for obese and children particularly, they're born with their bodies programmed to be obese. And this happens, in fact, in, in utero, as they're seeing such high blood sugar in the mothers that they overdevelop insulin-secreting cells in their pancreas, and the result is that when they're born, they over-secrete insulin to the carbohydrates in their diet, and that over-secretion causes them to store fat. And each generation gets worse when these babies grow up, they're much more likely to be obese or diabetic or gestationally diabetic when they in turn get pregnant if they're girls, and then they're going to pass this on to their kids. And this is what makes this whole process really frightening. So you, you add sugar to a diet, to any, again, like a Native American diet, and it's like lighting a fuse mm -hmm. on, a, on an explosion or a... a, a that, that each generation is going to get worse and worse. And um, that's one of the things that scared me the most in writing this, because you can't prevent this diabetes, you can't prevent these epidemics by telling people to eat less and exercise more. Um, right. That's not the treatment, it's not the cure, and it certainly isn't going to help this generational issue. Right. This, it, a lot of, of interesting stuff comes out there. Uh, the, the indigenous populations didn't have this issue until their diet became westernized. Uh, and it's especially interesting that you look at some of the, the high-fat diets of like the Inuits and, and others that, uh, you know, fat had very little to do with their health issues. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time here, but this book, The Case Against Sugar by Gary Taubes, is, is an interesting read. And those of us who are experiencing some of those symptoms might find it particularly enlightening. Uh, because we know that diabetes and obesity also seems linked to other chronic diseases uh, that we call diseases of the aging, uh, heart disease, hypertension, uh, stroke, and Alzheimer's, which is sometimes called diabetes type 3. So there's a lot of worthwhile uh, 
development of this topic. It's, it's a good read, well-researched. We've been talking with Gary Tobbs, the author. The, the book is The Case Against Sugar. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening. Thank you.